should start. Yeah, go. So I'm going to pass around a prop because this is the session on writing your own textbook. So the introductory material is the fact that echo, echo. <laughs> although I could not stop for death. Echo, echo. Okay, I'll just I'll just keep talking. <clears throat> Writing your own textbook, should you be so inclined, is almost always going to involve electronic files these days. And it might involve electronic delivery. I, I'm trying to keep the context open enough so that you could accommodate almost any sort of fit of creativity that took you. But um, for purposes of research, we decided to look into writing a textbook that could actually appear on an e-reader device. This is the device that we bought at the Elbogen Center. This is a Sony PRST something, which I think is now just called uh, Sony Reader. Uh, they, this, like many electronic devices, there are lots of gyrations in terms of uh, new models and versions, and, and all of a sudden, the one that you thought was so great is completely obsolete, and you got to get a new one. So that's the kind of thing that happens. But uh, this is what we got. And I'm just going to show you, I'll just pass this around in case anyone has not seen an e-reader. This is just a little excerpt, various pieces, uh, an earlier version, in fact, of the textbook that I'm going to show you in development. So if you want to look at how it actually appears on an e-reader, then to go to, from one page to the next, you can just swipe your finger across like that or use the arrow keys to go back to the table of contents, it's that middle button right there with a the little house, the home button. And it's introduction to the, and you can select that book again just by tapping on it. And you'll find yourself more or less where you were before. I think this is just the first five after lets. So if you want to take a look at that, that's kind of one of the intended destinations. So, Cody, are we good? OK. <clears throat> if you look at your handout, of which I need one, of course, which will be on the Evolution Conference website, you'll see that uh, I'm going to describe various methods. But I'm going to focus on the one I used, which is a combination of free software and standards-based formats, rather than proprietary software. But I'll touch on that a bit, too. The first, the first uh, paragraph right there is probably the most important thing. And if you all rise in a body and leave after I note that, then you know that's OK. I understand. There is no magic book generator that takes arbitrary documents as input and produces exactly the format that each student need, needs as output. Sorry. We have to think about things. And in fact, uh, we have to do some planning, as you'll see there in um, the rest of the introduction section. Uh, sometimes as we pursued this project, as I looked into this a bit, sometimes it seemed like this was just a nest of formats and conversions. It seemed like ebook publishing was all about file formats, applications, and the incompatibilities between version formats for one application and formats for another application. Well, crikey. So we'll try to do the most general and kind of useful thing. But if you look, if you see the uh, list there, input and output specifications, manuscript elements, and distribution options, these are the things that I suggest you think about in advance um, in order to drive the, your choices for uh, tools and so forth. Let me state the assumptions here. I'm thinking of a textbook as being a sort of classical thing. That is, it's a whole set of materials you prepare in advance and you want to give to your students in some form. So that means it's relatively long. It's relatively fixed. You're going to have it all done before the class starts. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's the idea anyway. So real, you know, a, a book, a, a book, a real book, a real textbook. <clears throat> I 
uh, use uh, HTML. I forgot to see if we even have OpenOffice on this computer. I'm looking for a word processor because we're going to dispense with approach two and approach three first, and then we're going to go back to approach one, which is what I did. So if you look at the methods here in your notes, that's what we're talking about. When uh, we gave this workshop as a sort of two-session thing over the summer, uh, we have LibreOffice. <clears throat> uh, Bob Sprague from management is the person who did approach uh, two. So it's listed down there in the table as the professional, the professional method, in which he wrote pretty much in Microsoft Word. So he used a plain old word processor. He actually wrote uh, quite a bit in Scrivener, which is um, one of the things I'm calling an intermediate application. It's a tool that uh, fills in some of the parts between document composition and actual book publishing that you would want to fill in. And I'm only fire, I'm firing up LibreOffice here just to show you that there are free alternatives to Microsoft Word. I don't think we even happen to have Microsoft Word on this computer, on the, the um, Mac side anyway. So uh, it's a standard word processor. And that means you can do things like create bulleted lists and you can format your text with italics. Uh, you can do a lot more than that, of course. And Microsoft Word is quite powerful and it's imitators as well, including things like uh, heading styles, indexes, and so forth, which are elements that you might want to include in a book. So <clears throat> I'm not qualified to go through the entire, uh, all the details of this approach. So I would ask you to get in touch with Bob Sprague or <coughs> ask me to get in touch with him if you wish. That was his composition tool. or That is Scrivener and Microsoft Word were his composition tools. I'm not going to do anything here. You know how word processors look. I don't have to do anything, right? This is only up here for uh, <coughs> sort of illustration purposes. Let's, but let's look at the rest of the details about his method here in the table. The way he transformed his file, given a very long Microsoft Word file, into an ebook is with um, <clears throat> a couple of other application programs, namely InDesign from Adobe and iBook Author. <clears throat> this is where we run right smack into the problem of ebook formats. He was interested in publishing to EPUB, which is a, uh, a standard, a worldwide standard, and also Mobi. Mobi is the format. These are explained on the back, on the second side, by the way. Mobi is the format for the Kindle e-reader. And uh, he also wanted a PDF version of his book, of his manuscript. And the last entry in that little cell there says that he used iBook Author to convert to iBook. That is to publish his work as in iBook format. So iBook is a proprietary format, proprietary to Apple, of course. So you have to use an Apple product to create an, uh, an Apple file. iBook being an Apple formatted file, iBook Author is the product that he used. If you can imagine on the screens, a really beautiful demo of iBook Author. You're not going to see it here because I don't have it and uh, <clears throat> I don't use it. But we did have someone come to the technology boot camp this summer, right, Christy, who was from Apple and demonstrated iBook Author to lots of wows because it really creates beautiful materials, of course. Everything from Apple is pretty much creates beautiful materials. If you want to go that way, then there are just a couple of tips there at the very end for you, although I cannot provide too many details. And one of them is that Bob Sprague recommends conformity to the iAuthor templates. So you, the, one of the reasons that their books look beautiful is because they've already figured out all the details of layout. You have to choose one of those 
paradigms. If you try to mess with it a little bit, you'll get in big trouble, he said. So stick with the I author templates. <clears throat> OK, so that's one approach. Look back up at approach three. So before we plunge into what I did, I'm just going to remark that really a lot of, there's a lot of software um, <clears throat> acquisition, learning, and execution that's necessary for this process. But most of my students, I think, would be happy with a PDF. If I just handed them a PDF, either on a CD, or mailed it to them, or put it on a file server, they'd be fine with that. So if you don't want to do, go through this at all, there's no reason to create uh, an iBook or an eBook object <clears throat> unless you actually want it, unless your target is actually one of these devices. Um, I'll tell you one of the other things we found out is that PDFs, although most of these devices will accept and display PDFs, they're, they're, it's, it's a terrible way to read a PDF. Either you get really tiny little print so you can see the whole page, or you get big print, which means you, only, you have to scroll back and forth for every single line, which is just as annoying as the day is long. Did you guys want to see any of that? <clears throat> So if you just want a file, if you just want a big, if you want your textbook to be a big old file, and you just want to give it to your students that way, then I'd say just write in Microsoft Word, save as PDF. You could give them a Microsoft Word file, of course, but I think there is something uh, a little bit weird about the fact that that would be editable. You know, you don't want your students to go in and change the textbook to suit themselves, even by mistake. So I think in general you want something that's kind of frozen. <coughs> and um, not writable. OK, we can get rid of LibreOffice. LibreOffice and OpenOffice. I don't even know how to pronounce Libre. Libre, Libra, I don't know. Mm. <coughs> Are um, free alternatives to Microsoft Word in case you want to pursue one of those paths. Now, the path I pursued is described in Approach 1 and also down there in the second line of the table. Now, it's time to it's time to face it's time to face the music. It's time to look at the file formats there on the back just to see just so you can see what the context is here. Suppose I want to create an ebook that's um, available to my student to my students in every ebook format known to mankind. Well, I better do an EPUB. As I said, EPUB is the format that's um, based on standards that many devices and application programs follow. But I better also make it available in Mobi because Mobi is the only thing that runs on a Kindle, on a Kindle e-reader, that format. And um, maybe I should also make it uh, available in as a PDF, just because that's a kind of uh, handy, down and dirty format that is uh, useful, although not on e-readers. And um, I might also want to make it uh, available to them in print. I might also want to give them options for printing, printing on paper, paper, actual paper in case that's what they want to do. OK, so I want to do all those things. Uh, I want to do all those things. And I, since I know that EPUB, EPUB is actually a bundle of HTML files. So the EPUB format, which is what, what gets transferred directly to a device like that, just copied from the computer to that device, is a file that says blah.epub. The EPUB format is a um, zipped file of HTML subfiles. Now, because of that, <coughs> and also because I've been writing in my work in HTML for many years, most of it is displayed on a web page someplace, somewhere, eventually, I'm choosing to use an HTML editor. And I also like a text-based format. So instead of using Microsoft Word, which is another option here, I'm going to write HTML 
editor <clears throat> just to emphasize that <clears throat> that's the type of product that I'm using for the actual authoring, the actual composition. And the one I'm choosing is called Amaya, which is taking a bit of time to come up here. Where are you? Come on. Come on. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> while we're waiting for that, let me note that um, any of the software that I mention and some that I've already mentioned, there's some specific websites for where to obtain it. <clears throat> so I am going to open my file now that Amaya is up, open my document, which happens to be already in its list right here. And just to show you what Amaya looks like, go away, go away. What happened? I thought my doc disappeared. Cody, did you make my doc permanent? Oh, sure. <clears throat> uh, and for some reason, it's not finding it right here on my little zip drive. Let's see if my little zip drive is still, still present. Yeah, come on. It's right there. It's right there. Oh, I, I moved it. I put it into a directory. Never mind. Never mind. My fault. So those of you who remember and loved WordPerfect because it showed you what was going on might <clears throat> like plain old HTML editing for the same reason. Although, as I say, you can, uh, you can work in Microsoft Word and, and save it as HTML. Uh, right with Amaya, what I get is the HTML. So this is the actual text file, and this is its rendering. HTML is the language of the web. So what web browsers do, browsers like Firefox, Internet Explorer, and so forth, do is they take this set of text and formatting information and they render it. That means they just present it in the formatted version. So here's the web browser version right here. I like this pr particular product for editing because I can work on either side. I can work in either view. So here's my little pieces of my textbook, various stuff going on here. And I can, <clears throat> if I see something I don't like and it needs to be changed at a kind of low level, I can change it in the HTML view or I could change it in the WYSIWYG view, the what you see is what you get view and e either change is reflected on the other side. Uh, I'm not here to teach you HTML, in case you're um, hoping for that. But if you were hoping for that, I have uh, a couple of references here, also in the specifics section, uh, <clears throat> on uh, ways to learn HTML. We, we, HTML. we might take a look at those. Uh, there's a product called Thimble. It's a new thing from Mozilla that's incredibly uh, easy. It also does the same. It presents things uh, together. It presents the HTML and the way it actually looks together. So we have uh, other things. We, there's, here's a bunch of materials. Yeah, this is all, that's fine. That's good stuff. Um, I see that some of my formatting is off because I don't have a, a style sheet opened. So let me do that. Style sheet is, um, this is also not going to be found because I changed the file. A style sheet is just an external set of formatting instructions if you got to be comfortable with HTML, you might want to uh, <clears throat> go back here. Yeah, you might want to uh, put some time into that as well. But we're not going to do much except to look at the, we might, in, it, let's insert just a, a sort of booky element that I might want to 
have in here. So I've got some, I've got some references and I've got some exercises and uh, I want to do some, I want to do some cross references. So in a textbook, what would we do if we wanted to refer to a previous section or a previous page or a previous item of some kind? We might put in a footnote. <coughs> a footnote could be used as a reference or it could be used um, as a cross reference. Uh, here, of course, this is HTML, so I can actually just put in, um, the reason this is jittery is because Amaya, uh, the World Wide Web Consortium, which actually produces Amaya, ran out of money, and um, <clears throat> it's not being, it's not being supported very well anymore. So, <laughs> this, this makes me crazy. Uh, I had other systems. I have other systems that this works a lot better. It shouldn't be jittering like this. But, but let me just say a word about free software. Well, this brings up this brings up the point that uh, Amaya is free, even though it is from the World Wide Web Consortium, which is a governing body that produces standards regarding the internet. They they run out of money just like other organizations run out of money. So this particular product, this particular piece of software, has not been updated for this version of the Mac for some time. So as it, even though it's still working, like, as I say, it's a bit jittery. <clears throat> it also runs on uh, Linux and Windows systems, and that's another reason that I like it. But you might prefer, so I'm using this thing called Amaya, which I'm going to write down here only a few of you can see. But you might prefer CMonkey if you wanted to use an HTML editor. CMonkey was an old one, that sort of went dormant for a while, but now it's back. <clears throat> Let's see. I'm going to, I see my resolution has changed in a kind of inconvenient way. So, uh, since we got the, since I got here into the, uh, okay, yeah. I'm going to make this, uh, I, I, what I'm doing here is I'm making the title of that table into a target. <clears throat> I'm going, just to see how that works, I'm going to show the targets in the document. There's a target in my document. This wouldn't show to readers outside. But I had a reference to that thing, that thing, uh, selection sort, somewhere down here, if I can find it reasonably. Yeah. So having set that target, I already did this for the corresponding object, the insertion sort. Having set that target, I actually want to no, don't do that. I just want this part. Thank you. Yep. Having set that target now, I want to link to it. So Amaya makes this kind of thing possible. I can say that I want a clickable. I, I can say that I'm going to find the link and click on it. I can go back to the one I want, which I think was this one. I can click right here. And now... <clears throat> I will find if I can find that place again, we will see that it this is a link. So this is a link and this is a link. And now and if I were to view this as HTML just as a plain old web page, if I anyone who clicked there would go back, would go to the other spot in the text. Okay, well I'm done dinking around with this for now. So let, we'll pretend that my textbook is all is written. The authoring part is done. As I say, if you're interested in working in HTML, there are many other ways to use, to get the same, ooh, <laughs> yee, cool is that, to get the same effect. Now, uh, there are two, there are going to be two other applications involved here. So I used a Maya. I'm going to use Siegel. Siegel is kind of the same, uh, plays the same kind of role that uh, Bob Sprague was, was using Scrivener for. So it adds some sort of booky elements. It's going to make a table of contents, and it's also going to 
bundle everything up as an EPUB. In fact, I, this is the Siegel. Siegel is also free software, which means that I had a little bit of trouble figuring out how to use it. Uh, this is the interface for it. Another choice that you would have, you could compose your entire book right here in this window. You could write the whole thing in Siegel itself. I don't find that quite as uh, easy to work with as um, Amaya. Although if it keeps on jittering, I might have to. No. Siegel wants either plain text or HTML. Okay, you can use plain text, and it'll uh, you know you could add um, markup elements in Siegel. Okay, so here's the file that I was just working on. Here's my little textbook. It's really a text booklet that I'm so proud of. Siegel is going to load it up, and I'm going to see a preliminary table of contents, and I'm going to see pretty much what it looks like. I'm going to be missing some uh, images. I think that in the interest of time, we might want to just skip past the image stuff. Images, I have some flowcharts and things, would go in that uh, directory right there, the images directory. How I, I am, however, going to put one image in here. It's going to be my cover page. So I am going to add an existing file. All of this is on my little USB drive. So I happen to have a cover page image right there, already done. I just, I just used Microsoft Paint or something to do this. It's not very pretty, but that's okay. So now it's in the images directory, and with another Siegel operation, I am going to designate that as the cover image. It's not necessarily going to show right here yet. And now I am going to... Um, you know, there's some, my table of contents shows some chapters already. I'm not sure why that's there. I think that might be an artifact from previous versions of this because normally I would have to break this up into chapters myself unless, it, unless it's detecting the word chapter. I don't think that's true. But uh, so another thing I'm doing here in this Siegel interface, can you see that little chapter break? I'm inserting chapter breaks at the proper places. There's one of my flow charts that's missing, so I could put in an image for that. I'm inserting, meanwhile, chapter breaks as we go along. This is another uh, sort of touchy thing about Siegel. You can't actually insert the chapter break right here where it says chapter 5. You have to go somewhere in the previous paragraph. <sighs> okay. Yeah, fine. <clears throat> okay. Did I say what this textbook was all about? I'm teaching a class called Introduction to the Philosophy of Computer Science, which is not only a new class here, it's kind of a new field altogether. So, where did you come from? I don't want you. Thank you. I, did, I created an extraneous list element there. So I just love doing this because, of course, I like admiring my work as I go through. I think I created another extraneous list element up there. Okay, that's just about it for chapters. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate, can you see at the bottom, I'm going to generate a table of contents from the headings. Uh, it will do this automatically, but I don't, it, it pretty much, Siegel pretty much figures out where all of the breaks of different kinds of material are, but I don't want the title to be in the, um, I don't, table of contents, thank you. I don't want the title to be in the table of contents, so I'm taking all of the, yeah, I, I took out the title, the preface, and so forth, but I do want this chapter, I want chapter one, I want chapter two, and um, I think I want the subsections to be included in the table of contents as well. Okay, so now I have a table of contents. I don't know what happened to chapter nine. Chapter nine got 
hammered somehow. I think that's because I created an extraneous character. Let's just leave that alone. Uh, you can see that there's a new file there called, or this was there before, but it's been recreated, toc. <coughs> ncx. That's one of the EPUB elements. So now, having just done a little bit of work with Siegel, I am ready to save this whole thing as an EPUB. See, there's the destination format, .epub, and there's the name of my little book. So I'm going to put that right there on my uh, <clears throat> USB drive as well. And now we are done with Siegel. So that's how I got what I wanted. What I wanted was this thing right here. Where did my EPUB go? There. It went right here. Okay. That's what I wanted. I wanted blah blah dot EPUB. Now I could in various ways transfer that file directly to that device and it would be an e-readable book on that device. Uh, for the sake of my students, however, I am going to convert this to several different formats. And to do that, I'm going to use yet another application, yet another free application called Calibre. Calibre is kind of a library application. It does a whole lot of things. And uh, it's, it's, it's not Calibre. I uh, watched a video by the developer, and he calls it Calibre. Caliber. And he also spells it with a small c, which makes me crazy, so I spell it with a capital C, just because. <clears throat> and boy, it does lots of things. I see. I think I just installed it here. It's not open source, but it's free. Well, it might even be open source. He might have the source code. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. <clears throat> Now, I want my device back because I want to see if I can actually transfer the new version of the book to that device. Where is my device? There it is. <coughs> Thanks. So this is Caliber, and um, it, it it does it does lots of things. Uh, it comes with a little ebook right there called the Caliber Quick Start Guide. the The window that you see in the middle is this is sort of like your your library. So all the books you want to maintain or keep track of, you can add to there to there, and then. Uh, drive them to different destinations or keep them here on a central computer or whatever. Let's, um, let's first do this. Let's do view with this caliber quick start guide. So what we're doing is we are going to read an EPUB. So this view thing is an e-reader application. It's not an e-reader device. I'm running this on my MacBook. I'm running this on a laptop rather than on one of these things. But this is an e-reader device. If I can get it going here. <clears throat> Which kind of mimics the way that it looks. Yeah. On, on an actual e-reader. <coughs> no, that's not what I want. I don't want the, I don't want the file information. I see that um, this is, something is barking at me from the e-reader world. I don't want that either. I want to look at this in 
I don't want to read a random book. I want to read this one. This book right here. Okay, that looks better. <clears throat> you can, uh, just, just a note about e-reader, no, not this. This is the reader for, this is the reader for Mac. This is the, this window that keeps trying to come up is actually the one from Sony. This is the application that comes with an e-reader from Sony. And no, I don't want to sign in, I don't want to go to their web page, and I don't want to buy a whole lot of books. Thank you. That's what it's trying to get me to do. No, go away. Leave me alone. Thank you. Now I've started, I've started Caliber three different times. <laughs> Maybe now it'll go if there's no e-reader, if there's no Sony reader application. Maybe it won't. <clears throat> well, let's edit. Let's uh, add some books. There we go. Finally, there's the ebook viewer. I have a note about this in um, on the materials, just to provide another level of complication. So, in my list of popular ebook readers. At the very end there, besides the devices, the devices that you can actually hold in your hand, I also have an example application, which happens to be called e-reader, but e-reader is also a generic name for e-readers. This application is from Palm. And so for anybody who used to have a Palm Pilot or a Palm device, if you ever read books on it, now you can get an e-reader application that runs on various devices it reads that format. It reads the Palm book or file format. So that's just an illustration of the complicated kinds of relationships that you can have between the file format, the e-reader application, and the device. So that e-reader from Palm, you could run, for example, on a Mac laptop. You could run it on a Windows computer. You can run it on various Android and iPhone devices as well. So now we are looking at an e-reader right here running on this computer, running on this Mac laptop. And it's got the same kind of simple interface that most e-readers have, which means that you can go to the next page. <clears throat> And you can go to the page after that. And you can go to the page after that. OK, fine. So we could actually read a book here. This is kind of what an e-reader device looks like. And this is the way it behaves. There are a lot of other things we could do here. Let me say something about accessibility. Uh, one of the great things about e-readers, of course, is that they are somewhat customizable to the reader's needs. So, for, and you can see that here, I can make the font size bigger. I can make it bigger. Many e-readers include audio, so they do voice, uh, they do text to voice, with uh, mixed success. One that seemed to do it pretty well was the uh, Microsoft Reader. Microsoft Reader used to come with. Uh, Windows XP or something like that. And it, it got canceled for some reason. It had also a proprietary file format, which can be converted to other file formats. So more, more complications there. It had a good um, text-to-voice option, though. It's too bad that that's not available universally. But for your students, you might consider that to be one of the clear advantages of writing an electronic textbook. They can read it on a device that's accessible to them. OK, I think we've had enough of this e-reader. That's nice. That's what, what they look like <clears throat> running on a computer. Now what I'm going to do is add my book. Yes, I want to put my book into Caliber, because Caliber is the way that I'm going to transfer my book to this device. So I'm going to go find it. Where was it? It was over here someplace. Uh, I had it. There it is. Yeah. <clears throat> OK, so Caliber adds it to the list that I see here, my sort of 
library list any minute now. Thank you. I can um, add some metadata. So I could uh, make clear what the uh, title, I could, I, instead of using the sort of short, uh, file name title, I can give it a better title, I can make that the, the sort T, I can do all kinds of things. I can specify different authors, oh that's right, I, hadn't, I haven't specified myself at all on this particular system yet, so, and yes, this is the non, there we go. <clears throat> I could include other authors, I can give it a rating, shall I give my book a rating? <laughs> Oh, that would be just too immodest. So, and you can see that there is there is a the cover page is now showing now that it's an actual an actual EPUB format. Okay, well this is great stuff. Now, uh, one of the things that I really like about Caliber is this: I can convert this book to practically every format known to mankind. Is this great stuff or what? Including LIT. This is the old Microsoft e-reader format. I want, I, it's already an EPUB. I want to convert it to Mobi for the Kindle. So I'm going to do that. And I don't know if you can see the way Caliber tells you something is going on is way down here at the bottom right. There's a little wheel turning and as soon as the job is done that, that'll stop. And while we're at it, let's convert it to, <clears throat> I also converted this to PDF for my students. PDB, I think that's the old POM format. What else should we convert it to? Uh -huh. Good where, would you, where would you put it? Uh, that depend on this. That doesn't depend on the book, right? So this particular device allows readers to add notes to themselves as they're going through the book. It's clumsy. You can add notes with a sort of awkward, you know, screen uh, touch, touch screen interface so you can make lines and stuff. And then they're saved as little pictures. Or you can add notes with a really horrible touch screen keyboard, which is also not, not, not very good. So uh, on this particular device, I would say that that interface is not hospitable. It's possible. On other devices, I don't really know. So if they were going to be using a laptop, how would you probably do that? They're not using a laptop. Remember, they're using an e-reader application. So whatever e-reader application they choose to run might allow them to add notes with the keyboard. I think that uh, the Caliber e-reader application does allow note adding. And others might as well. I just don't know. So, well, if you have if you have a if you have the software and and software, right? I mean, not every you have to have an application like Acrobat <coughs> Acrobat Professional that will actually PDF write two PDFs and write PDFs, right? So, yeah, any other free version of that, right? So uh, anyway, so there's lots of other formats here. Some of them I don't even know anything about, and I I know enough. I know enough formats. I don't want any more formats. Okay, so I think we're done making up new versions of my book. They don't show here. Just the book itself shows here. But now, I want to publish. Finally, I want to publish. Let me. Bleh. They show over here. I just said the different formats don't show there in the library. The library just shows the book. The different formats show here. And I could open any one of them, save it, download it, and so forth. Now, it looks like it's still, is it still a converting original EPUB? Did I, did I convert to that too? I must be, I must be going wild. Anyway, let's uh, transfer it to the device. I don't know if you noticed, you probably didn't, but this little device icon came up when I successfully plugged this uh, Sony reader into the laptop. So now it's ready to, um, I don't, this is the thing I want. I don't want to look at the device. I want to send to the device. So I'm just going to send to device 
There we go. It's the highlighted one. It knows that what it needs is the EPUB format because it knows what this device is. It knows it's a Sony reader. So that's the whole sequence. Now I have a new version on this device of my e-textbook. For my students, what I do is I take these three files, the EPUB file, the MOBI file, and the PDF file, and I transfer them all to uh, the course website where they can download either format as they choose. Okay. Uh, let's see if there's anything else we should address. Yeah, probably I see a misspelling Android and Apple iOS devices. Let me go into the distribution notes at the very end there. Um, there's some accessibility information given there. DAISY is a set of standards that's meant to work with EPUB itself for um, making it easy for assistive devices, so such as screen readers and so forth, to uh, render or make uh, e-books available to vast arrays of readers. Do you know anything about DAISY, Casey? You know, because the Daisy, the Daisy website is, uh, you what? I think it's fairly proprietary. Yeah, right. I think, I think the best way to get Daisy is to buy some kind of software that provides it to you. So in other words, Daisy may be a set of standards, but it's not published as a set of standards that would make sense for any of us to follow. It adds special tags and so forth. So, uh, but still, that's something to consider for many of your students. You can get it through, um, I mean, you can get books that are published in the DAISY format through <laughs> bookchart.org. And that, and, and through this, um, the Department of Education, if you have a special needs, you get those books. The only problem is that the audit to the uh, voice is a computer generated voice. So it's pronunciation based off that. So yeah. It doesn't always sound like a human voice or sound. But right. it does. Oh, yeah. And as, as we like to say, the, um, making, writing a book so that it's easily accessible, or writing any kind of document so that it's easily accessible to many different kinds of technology and different kinds of people with different kinds of abilities is really pays off for everybody. Um, for example, if you make sure that it's audioable, then your students, even your students who don't have a sight impairment, can listen to it in the car if they want. I mean, I just, they can listen to it in their bike helmets or whatever students do these days. I don't, I don't, I couldn't possibly tell you. <clears throat> Yeah, the Adobe Reader will Adobe Cast version six will read stuff out loud unless it's an image file. If it's a text-based PDF, it'll, yeah. it'll be Oh, that's interesting. I see. Okay, so we should mention that there really are two different kinds of PDFs. Early PDF was just an image, so all a PDF was just pictures of your pages, right? It wasn't reflowable at all. It couldn't be reformatted. But of course, you got exactly what you wanted in the sense that that was your what you saw was the page that you wanted, was the page that you had designed. But now PDFs are more text conscious, is that fair to say? So that not only can you write to them sometimes, but sometimes they're reflowable. That means sometimes PDF readers will actually wrap the lines appropriately to the screen, for example, uh, and other tricky things like that. And you can search them if they're text-based. You can search for particular words and so forth. Adobe has a tool that tells you how accessible things are. People say, yeah, okay. it, this is readable, but there's no landmarks, there's no headings, there's no anything. It's okay. just all the same thing. And this is good to know because PDF remains a really, it's an important document format. It's an important and useful document format. Nathan? Okay. Uh, and the other, the other notes that I wanted to mention here, uh, you can, there are web services that will allow you to sell Sell your book. You can sell your fabulous textbook. 
You can soak your students without even getting the bookstore involved. You can upload your book to a website, tell your students to go there, and they can pay a nominal amount and get it sent to them either as an electronic file or printed. For people who really want print, you can allow them, uh, you can have your book distributed on hard copy that way. So let's just look at lulu.com. I was looking at text, I was looking at Booklets World the other day. Book World was one that we had kind of toyed with, but I couldn't get it, I couldn't get the website to come up. You might want to try this, bookletsworld.com. I couldn't get it to come up, but I also saw strange text about something were taking over your website. So I wonder if it had gotten hacked or something. Anyway, so I didn't put that one on this set of notes. But here's Lulu. You can print your you can print family histories, you can print calendars, you can print any kind of book. I think most of this is free. They offer paid services for editing and design and so forth. But I, I, I haven't pursued this myself. I think you can upload your book file here and EPUB, and your students can just go and get it somehow. And then what you mentioned what is Flat World. Flat World is more uh, has more of a professional arrangement. And it's actually been around for quite some time and <clears throat> calls itself a sort of different publishing paradigm. And it has uh, authors. So it has authors that are associated with it in different uh, <clears throat> disciplines, as shown. So I haven't pursued this either, but you might want to try that yourself. OK, questions? Any questions? Yes? What kind of regulations are there here in the US relative to royalty fees and things like that? It's completely up to you. There, you're, you're <clears throat> yes. Yes, that would be. I I have the very strong and um, I think uncommon view that you should never assign your own textbook to your students. I think that's a clear conflict of interest. I don't care who's publishing it. So you should never require your students to buy something that you make money from. I mean, I, that's. That's widely violated and it's widely approved in the academic world. And that, yeah, I understand that. That's fine. But yeah, in theory, you could do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm my, myself. Bob Sprague has an arrangement with a publisher, so he's actually going to publish his book, his textbook, which is then going to be on the market for all business law classes, and some of them will adopt it. You know, that's that's great. No. I, I never had any intention other than just giving mine to my students. So, but it, you know, it's kind of a fun thing to consider other options. Now, in his class, that West Business Law book is like two hundred and fifty dollars new. So, so all he he can sell it for two hundred and forty nine. Yeah. The College of Business has kind of a, a history of doing that. Penny Ainsworth, the associate dean, uh, yeah, acquired her can, textbooks. Boy, you know, textbook textbook publishing is a Sad, sad business these days in many ways. It's just, oh, we could go on for a long time about that. So you have no problem with students free. There's nothing Yeah, or even if other people, if other classes adopt it, you can make money from them, right? Because you're not you're not the one who's requiring those students to buy. Right. Yeah. But I just wouldn't encourage my own students for a textbook that I assigned that I was going to make money on. So that's all. Other questions? <clears throat> comment. With Flat World Knowledge, there are a number of free open textbooks here. As an instructor, you can go to Flat World Knowledge and see what they have. And if they're the content that you like, you can actually assemble different chapters from different books into your own custom textbook. And that's available for free on the web for your students. And they can pay like $15 and have it printed and shipped to them. Or print or 15 or another nominal fee where they can just print it themselves. So Flat World Knowledge, mm -hmm. you don't actually have to write the textbook. You can go and find chapters and content that you like or that you think would be useful for your students. And presumably the authors are getting <coughs> little mini royalties from that. Right. Through Flat World. Yeah, I think these are these are fine arrangements. Hmm? Okay. Anything else? 
All right, then I think we're about out of time, and you might want to move on to your next events. Thanks.